and thank you for staying with us. We are here live from Memphis, Tennessee with the Magnificat Day, Day of Joy. This is the third annual one coming again from the Memphis Cook Convention Center, joined again on set by our Father Joseph Mary Wolf, our chaplain of EWTN, and now a very special guest, uh, Mr. Roma Luzet, who is uh, vice president of actually the uh, Magnificat Publishing, right? Indeed. Now, we've been talking many times here to people who are representatives of the foundation, mm -hmm. and you're the publishing side, so you're really more closely tied directly to yes. what people would think is the Magnificat that yes. they get in there, they see in the pew in the church, yes, or indeed. they can sign up for. And we're thrilled uh, this year uh, that we're now able to offer this as a subscription through EW10's religious catalog. Yes, so indeed. people can go to our catalog and be able to offer this. And uh, you know, it was funny, just listening to Michael Warsaw, uh -huh. our, our CEO, talk about the fact and reminding us all that many years ago, right, Father, that uh, the founder of the Magnificat, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Dumont, was uh, actually on Mother Angelica's live show yeah. way back when. Yeah, indeed. And, and, and it's funny because in my heart, there's truly a real connection between EWTN and Magnificat. Is when I discovered both, I said, oh my God, they did it. Mm -hmm. They did something so beautiful, so perfect. That's what Magnificat is for prayer. That's what EWTN is, is to, to reach people through, through, through the media. And I think it's really the same the same idea that there is, that there is no limit. We can mm -hmm. do beautiful things that people want beautiful mm -hmm. things, longer for, you know, long for beautiful, um, well done, well, well crafted uh, 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 mm -hmm. services. Right. So. Well, let me ask you one question for yourself. You're, you're, you're living in the States now. You're, yes. you're working on this full time. Yes. Uh, you obviously weren't born in the United States that no. I know of. Uh, what gave you the impetus? What was it in your life, your faith walk, mm -hmm. that made you decide to dedicate your self to something like the Magnificat and basically bring your life to the United States to work on? Well, first, it started with Magnificat. I was 14 when it, when it started in 1992 in France. And it was in the middle of lo lots of material that was clearly not at that level. Mm -hmm. And we were all so amazed by, by what it was, by the beauty, by, by the content, by the ba Bible paper. Um, that it truly made my prayer life and built my prayer life at a time where it was not that easy to receive uh, uh, what, what one needed really to grow in, mm -hmm. in, in a spiritual life. So that really went along with me. And when I gra graduated from my business school, um, we were left in Indonesia with my wife, and my wife is Irish, mm -hmm. uh, to serve there in a Catholic university that was starting in the, in the middle of the in coconut trees. Yes. an Islamic country or It East is the Timor biggest Islamic what? country indeed right. okay. in the world, okay. but they have lots of different pockets. pockets One right. of them is in the north where the Dutch were very present. It's still very right. Protestant and there Our are still a few Our own Father Miguel is, uh, is yes, indeed. comes from Indonesia, That's right? right? He's, He's the first Indonesian priest actually uh, to be ordained in the United States. Is he really? Really? I, yes. did, I, I didn't wow. even know that. Well, there you go. I think they're and that's where, and that's in the, yes. in the Far East that I discovered EWTN, and truly mm. that was a milestone as well in my, in, in, mm. in my faith and in, and in the growth of, of, of my faith. Mm -hmm. And so when I came back from Indonesia with, with, with my MBA and things, it, I want to work for a real company uh, that, that has really real standards of, of, of production, right. but also something that makes sense for me. And there's one big group in France, big publishing group, that is Media Participation and Magnificat is one of the company. Mm -hmm. uh, it's run by Monsieur Montagne. Right. And I just went Who's to see Who's here today too. He is today too, yes. right. Right. Um, And I went to see him and said, what do you have for me? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I have something for you in Magnificat. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. And there we go. So I started running uh, Magnificat from France, mm -hmm. all, the different, all the different editions. Now we have seven languages. Um, so the we, first one was in French. The first right? one was in French, and it was German, uh, American, Spanish. Mm -hmm. Now we have a British edition that is a spin-off of mm -hmm. the of the American mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. We have a Lithuanian edition. We have a Slovenian edition. Oh wow! Okay. And we're working on a on a Polish and a, and a Brazilian edition as well. So as Michael said, EWN's everywhere, Magnificat's everywhere. We're, we're, we're getting, getting there. there. We're getting there. We're getting there. We're getting, getting so right there. now we serve one million right. reader throughout mm -hmm. the world. Now one of the things that Father Joseph and I were, were talking about, and maybe you could follow up on this too, we mm -hmm. were talking about you know the wonderful ability to go and visit Therese's relics and her parents' relics and in a sense, the family and the beautiful, you know, mm -hmm. I love the, the inter, 
locking, uh, you know, wedding rings. Oh, it's such a beautiful image. But we were talking about it, and you were asking me too, that the idea is the Therese connection because of the nature of Magnificat or because it came out of France? Yes. Right? Well, we were talking about that. Right. Yes, we were interested, and it's a beautiful relic we'll be talking about later mm -hmm. that we had a chance to visit with the, the, uh, with, uh, the relics of her parents and mm -hmm. then St. Therese as well. So it's the whole family and the domestic church yes. uh, symbolized by the glass yes. covering. Yes. But what significance does St. Therese have to the Magnificat? Well, she's. We, maybe we, we didn't see all the connections when we started. She was just very dear to her heart and very dear to Monsieur Dumont's heart. Okay. Um, there is a missionary uh, dimension in Magnificat, and, 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 and she, she's, she's the, the, uh, uh, the patron. The patron. Yeah, exactly. right. Yeah. Right. So, uh, and on the very first little leaflet that we did 16 years ago, starting here in the US, there was a small image of Therese as a little girl. Mm -hmm. and, and she's truly been with us all that time. And now that her parents are blessed, it makes so much sense that you know, a family that prays mm -hmm. will make sense, mm -hmm. saints, truly. And, and, and so the connection is just right. growing and growing and growing. Hmm. Yeah, and family that stays together makes sense and makes <laughs> saints, you're right. There you go. And she was very much at the beginning of VWTN because right. Mother Angelica was healed as a teenage girl mm -hmm. through, uh, making an novena to St. Therese. And Therese had this desire to plant the cross on all the continents yes, of the world, mm -hmm. to spread the faith all over the world. So. Apparently she's doing it now from heaven, right? She's right. assisting yes, us indeed. in our works. Indeed. Yes, indeed. right. In fact, we were looking, I think, earlier about famous last quotes, and I think you actually had uh, Therese's oh, yes. last quote, right? I think Let's about I uh, her leaving this earth and yes. kind of her last I would spend words. spend my right? heaven doing, doing good on earth. Right. And she also said, "I have reached the point of this was towards the end of her life when she was right, suffering greatly. Words, right. I reached the end." The point of my not being able to suffer anymore because all sufferings are sweet to me. My God, I love you. Right. So she has Thank this you. way also to show us that there's a value to suffering. Mm -hmm. She united it to Christ. She continued to trust in Christ even through the difficulties of her life. Yes, yes. Right. Let me ask you as well with the, with the magazine itself. Now there's other things that the foundation does like lectures and other mm -hmm. things like that. Now you also, do you write for this? I know for, no, I for don't. the camera. But you did, um, you did put together the splendors of Magnificat, right? Yes, That's, yes. As an I, author. I, okay. When I don't work uh, for the magazine or for the, for the foundation, I'm, I'm an editor for uh, Magnificat and we've been putting with Pierre-Marie Dumont mm -hmm. this great series, Splendors of Magnificat, mm -hmm. Splendors of the Rosary, mm -hmm. uh, Splendors of the Creed last year with the Year of Faith and this year Splendors of Christmas. So it's, it's and we are developing with, it, with Ignatius Press as well mm -hmm. uh, a whole range of, of books for children and for yeah, well, you, the foundation has its own publishing arm, really, right? Not yet. Not no, yet? Not yet. So not what yet. exactly is the Magnificat, like the Christmas 2014 kind of catalog? That's Magnificat Publishing. Okay, yes. this mm -hmm. is their publishing. This is, yeah, this is the publishing. Okay. So that's part of the magazine. Then, that's really. part of the magazine. Gotcha. Indeed. Okay, great, Indeed. okay. Yes. So that's how that works. Now, let me ask you, so when you put together things like this, Magnificat <laughs> Advent Companion, yes. so does that come with my subscription? Is that something no, I get separately? No, that is something that, that you can buy, that parishes can buy. Mm -hmm. We sell about 300,000 each year, mm -hmm. and they're, put, they're all new every year, put by Father Peter John Cameron. Okay. Um, and, they're, and they're a great companion right. to work with Magnificat and to pray with Magnificat. So you do one for Lent or something maybe one as well? One for Advent and one for Lent as well, okay, yes. But I'm sure cool. many of your... Uh, viewers know about the Magnificat Advent and Lenten Who companion. selects the uh, meditations and the authors of the meditations? That's Father Peter John. He's okay. doing that on his own. I don't okay. know how he's been doing it for, for 16 years. <laughs> there, there are almost no, no repeats mm -hmm. and he finds beautiful meditation that really touched people's heart. It's, I'm sure he can tell you more about it mm -hmm. soon. Right, hopefully we get to talk to him a little bit later. We saw the yes. play, obviously, which was very exciting. Yes. And uh, back, in, back in Philadelphia last year, the one on uh, kind of Therese going to confession Indeed. was, uh, was yes. a very interesting play very as well. Very interesting play, yes. yes. He, he, he's, a, he's a playwright, mm -hmm. uh, um, and uh, that's, uh, that's, a great, that's a great addition to, to his many talents that people can see now. 
uh, more than uh, beside the magazine to see his talent as a speaker and as a playwright. Right, and speaking of speakers, we've got Father Barron's coming up in a few minutes. Just before we uh, let you go, because I know you've got a lot of things to do, you're heavily involved behind the scenes uh, with what's going on here. Have you seen the impact of having, let's say, Magnificat, this event, the day, not just the magazine as well, now that it's reaching out of the world, with working with EWTN together to promote it and raise the awareness, let's say for the people, did they see the event in Philadelphia and say, gee, I'd like to go there, oh, yeah. I'd like to be participant in it? So have you seen that growth yes, awareness yes. raised? We, the, um, Bernie Neal said there are 37 states here and the number of states keeps on, you know, of different states being represented at the Magnificat Day keeps on growing. Mm -hmm. So people's awareness of this Magnificat Day and of Magnificat, like EWTN, is a day-to-day -day, uh, 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 nourishment. And it's right. good to have this big event, this big live event, something that takes us out of our daily mm -hmm. routine yes. in a way right. and, 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 and give us a shot and then we're, we're back on track. It's like a one-day retreat, really, in it's a like lot a of ways. It's really great. Yes. Well, thank you so much for all you do, Ron. Thank you, Doug. Thank we you, We appreciate Father. it. Yeah. And we'll be back with more from the Convention Center here in Memphis. And we'll be interviewing Father Peter John Cameron, who we were just talking about right after this. Stay with us. back and thank you for staying with us here at the Magnificat Day, Day of Joy. This is the third annual coming to you live from the Memphis Cook Convention Center, of course, in Memphis, Tennessee. Information on this organization is MagnificatFoundation.org. And joining us on set, of course, is our own Father Joseph, but also we have the playwright himself we were just talking about, Father. Cameron, nice to be with you. Great to have you Thank here. Thank you so much, Doug. And uh, where do you find the time to write books and do everything else that you're doing? Well, I don't have any children, mm -hmm. <laughs> so that gives me a lot of time. So I get up early in the morning and I do my writing then. See, Father Joseph, it's what I've been telling you. See, <laughs> you're supposed to have more time to, yes, to create that, books, ne that next uh, book yes, we're waiting for you book. to come out. <laughs> it's what Dominicans are supposed to do, though. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's part of our charism. Well, yeah. we were, we were uh, you know, we saw the play that you did last year. It was a, a scene from the one with Therese uh, right. going to confession. Yeah. And this yeah. one, the, uh, the Women of the Well, which was an adaptation or a scene you said you, I think you added on for the 2004 play, right? Yes, the original play is called The Women Who Served. Right. And that features a number of scenes that are sort of like this one, mm -hmm. encounters between women and the Lord mm -hmm. that you would know from reading the scriptures. Right. So for this particular event, I took the original scene and modified it, lengthened it right. a little bit and sort of geared it to this event. Do, do you purposely change the language in a way that, you know, obviously the woman at the well is not talking in these and thous and things like that. And, and she even uses a couple of, like, what am I, a barmaid? I mean, that's not the type yeah, I mean, of I biblical don't... language you might expect. Is, was that to make it more relatable to the people today exactly, or yeah. to raise the awareness? Well, I don't or... know how to write these and thous anyway. Right. But I think uh, uh, one, one way of reaching people who, for whom this story is either unknown or, I don't know, kind of stale, mm -hmm. is by making it more relevant in terms of the language. As painters do sometimes, they'll take biblical scenes but have the, the characters dressed in the cl clothing of their period. Mm -hmm. So right, we exactly, did the right. same with the language in the play. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, meditations, I asked Roman about it, and he said, well, Father P uh, Peter John chooses all of those. How do you choose those meditations in the Magnificat? Well, Father Joseph, that is actually my favorite part of all of the work at Magnificat. And there is really no science. Um, we try, if there are saints of the month, mm -hmm. then we always, and they have writings, we, we try to pull something from their writings. We try to have so many that are more ancient, uh, sources, Fathers of the Church. We try to have quite a few that are women writers. We try to have some American writers. Mm -hmm. We try to I try to find sources that our readers might not be familiar with, mm -hmm. and that's basically how it works. And I, it's I'm constantly reading and constantly searching, and there's 
usually is a connection between the meditation and the gospel of the day. And sometimes it's direct, sometimes it's indirect, but that's the toughest thing is marrying the right meditation for the right day, yeah. And choosing yeah. maybe one line like you do sometimes and then going yeah. with that, running with that one line out that's of the scriptures. That's right, yeah. It's beautiful, yeah. it's, it's helpful too, and just uh, maybe a thought for a homily too, so it's helpful for yeah. us priests. And I choose them with priests in mind, knowing that sometimes it is a kind of a homily help. And when I always tell them it's a secret, but now I'll divulge it to the world is, just save one year's worth of Magnificats, mm -hmm. and when you're preparing your daily homily, choose, look at the meditation from last year, yes. and that way if there are Magnificat readers in the pew, <laughs> they won't know that you've chosen from Magnificat, don't forget, so, yeah. yeah. So. And you teach homiletics. I do, well, yes, right. I teach homiletics at, at the St. Joseph's Seminary Dunwoody, yeah, in New York. And so if someone asks you if you actually took it out of the Magnificat, you can give them that Jesuit-like answer <laughs> to say, well, not this year's edition, <laughs> right? right? Is that, is that what you're right. saying? That's we right. could, we yeah. could do something like yeah. that, right? Yeah, exactly, that's oh, right. Reservation. See? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, the thing that struck me too about the, the woman in the well is thinking about the synod that just happened. Yeah. And, and so much of talk, I mean, it wasn't the central theme of the discussion really the focus, but in a sense of, of her being married or how many yeah. times she had been married. Yes. And thinking about even what the discussions were at the synod in a relationship with marriage and sacramental marriage. What's quite interesting is this woman who has had several marriages and now is opting for something other than marriage, mm -hmm. even though she does everything she wants, she's not satisfied. Mm -hmm. And she knows that what she's looking for has somehow in this man who stands in front of her, the order that she needs for life and the sort of self-surrender and the self-sacrifice that she needs for life is only in a relationship with him. And who knows what happened to her afterwards, but I'm sure it was, without Jesus ever giving her a, mess, a, a lesson in moral theology, I bet you she went off to give the best pre-Cana courses anyone right, could ever right. give, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. I remember one of the stories that you had at the beginning of one of your books about this couple that met through Magnificat yes, and they ended yes. up getting married. Maybe yes. you could tell that little story. Yes, they were both <laughs> widowers. They were both in their 80s. Is that the story that you remember? Yes, and yes. And they were, they were both enthusiasts of uh, cycling and they were cycling through Europe and they wow. discovered that each one was carrying this little book with the red mm. line, and that's Magnificat. <laughs> mm. So they knew immediately that they shared many values. And right, right. So they, they, they struck up a friendship and within a few months they were married. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's great. great. Are there other stories of people that have come into the faith or maybe embrace their faith uh, more wholeheartedly because there of Magnificat? Are, there are. I think we really need to almost publish all the stories of right. conversion mm -hmm. or how Magnificat has been a great solace at a deathbed mm -hmm. or how it's been a help in reconciling yes members of the family who have been uh, separated from each other or I know parents sometimes will read passages to their children who are away at college just to give them the little boost the little mm -hmm. encouragement that they mm -hmm. need to get through right. some problem they're facing so there are gratefully many wonderful stories right. like that yeah it's interesting as, as we noted in reading through the descriptions and the reactions mm -hmm. to them, I mean, you could you could insert EWTN into where it's a magnificat people whose lives were changed and everything oh, sure, and that impact yes. and, and that consolation for like you said people yeah. dying and yeah. on their deathbed and things yeah. like that yeah one, one question I want to ask you because I was so interested in your play and in the idea of was there in a sense that she had an attachment to her own pain that she wasn't really willing to let go of in a sense yeah. the water jar I mean is that was that some well, of what was supposed the fact to be? that John the evangelist includes this detail about she left the water jar I mean mm -hmm. you could leave that detail out and the story makes perfect sense so by including that it's there not simply because it happened historically but because it has a theological mm -hmm. sense because scripture has a literal sense and also a spiritual sense so John is saying this is a symbol and he mm -hmm. loves to use symbols light etc so what does it symbolize and it seems that this happens to us sometimes. Mm -hmm. Because we don't find what we're looking for, we make a compromise mm -hmm. and we cling to that compromise because it's the only thing that keeps us sane. And I think that's what the water jar and her sort of very mm -hmm. compromised, reduced life signifies. And so when she meets Jesus, she's not even thinking about physical water anymore, you know, a tangible water. Mm -hmm. she, something has just set her free. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she leaves it behind as a sign of that. Now, how many plays have you actually written over the years? I, I think uh, probably about a dozen. You know, mm -hmm. some are very short and some are full length. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are they all basically Catholic or religious in nature? Have you written anything else in it? I've written a couple right? things that are um, uh, not expressly religious, but everything that I write 
is about redemption in, in some respect mm -hmm. because I try to write plays that reflect the human drama mm -hmm. and the human drama is rooted in the religious sense that no matter who you are and what you do you're made for God whether you know it or not mm -hmm. and so sometimes plays are very explicit about who this God is but sometimes they're not so there are plays about longing, there's plays about searching, there are plays about how the world can't satisfy this need that uh, St. Augustine would say, uh, my heart is restless till it rests in you. So that, those are the kinds of plays I try to write. We see a lot of Dominicans around here. And, yes, uh, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> our brothers we were trying to wipe out so. our cameras earlier. We should have had you sitting down here. <laughs> Why the presence of the Dominicans with the Magnificat events and your involvement as well? Well, mm -hmm. once I was invited to help with Magnificat, my first act was to ask my dear friend, Father Romano Cesario, to serve as the senior editor, mm -hmm. and then my dear friend, Father Michael Morris, to serve as uh, one of the editors of the art essay in the back. But in a day like today, where we want to have confessors, and mm -hmm. it's easy to ask our friends to come and, and pitch I in. Okay. And so they're here to hear confessions and pitch in other ways. But they're not well. necessarily formally involved outside of the couple of... No, they're the, just the, here for the day. I yeah. see. Yeah. The friends of the Magnificat Foundation. And you even mentioned St. Francis there at the top yes, of your list. Yes, absolutely. He was very proud. He stood up, he stood, <laughs> he stood up, he stood up a little, a little uh, higher up in his chair there. It's true. When, when you're, I was thinking about what you were saying in writing, pray, uh, you know, uh, with what you're doing in the plays and things like that, and the idea that, in a sense, because of the nature of the people we're trying to reach, some people need it explicit, yep. so they can get it, because otherwise they miss it. Yes. For other people, if it's too explicit, they don't want to get it, or they, right. they turn it off. That's right. And so there really needs to be all different various approaches exactly, that yeah. reach different people in different ways, yeah. and all yeah. of them are legitimate in their own sphere, right? Yeah. And it's the reason why I think theater is right at the heart of the new evangelization, because the new evangelization has to be new in art or expression and mode, mm -hmm. and the mode of theater is really a great thing, because people that won't go into a church might go into a theater. Mm -hmm. So if you can bring them in with, play, with a play that is very well done, good quality, etc., but it has this, not just, not just a message, but that it's conveying a lot of truth, right. then maybe it's going to kickstart that you know, longing for God that they just let lie dormant for a while, you know. Well, the truth connects, too. It we, does, We've known exactly, that, too, yeah. is that, you know, it, it really attracts, and, you know, people listen, yeah. and they may not even like it, but something clicks, and they start going, yeah. well, you know, something about what he said. I don't really agree with him, but there's something mm -hmm. about what he said I need to think about, maybe. Our theater is in New York City, underneath the church of uh, Our Lady of, uh, of Notre Dame, Church of Notre Dame. It's right near Columbia University. Right, sure. And when we yeah. first started, there were Dominicans in charge of the parish, and so they would meet the audience outside on the sidewalk and say, oh, come in through the church. That's mm -hmm. the easiest way to get downstairs because oh, really? the church is beautiful. Mm -hmm. So they would come in, they'd see this replica of the grotto in Lourdes. They'd be awestruck by it. They'd go downstairs and then they'd see beauty in the play. Mm -hmm. And hopefully they would connect, well, that beauty has a source and it's upstairs. Hoping mm -hmm. that they might start coming back to that place too. You know, here we are on November 1st, it's All Saints Day. Yeah. Yesterday we were talking about Halloween, the level of ghoulishness that uh, goes with Halloween, and the kind of almost this celebration of horror and ugliness yeah. for the sake of ugliness. Yeah. Why do you think we're, we're experiencing that? Because we're fallen, you know, and uh, nothingness is sort of part of the human condition, and uh, if, we, we can't, if we can't defeat it, then we want to sort of wallow in it a little bit, but you know, it, it, it's not very satisfying, mm -hmm. and I'm always happy when November 1st comes because <laughs> Halloween with all the sort of, you know, it's fun, but it's false too. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, it's right. over. And unfortunately they yeah. sell candy so it's very popular and, and yeah. you can make money with it. And yeah. poor Thanksgiving gets uh, like lost in the sauce yeah. there. You don't even know yeah. that that's there anymore. All right. yeah. Maybe talk about how beauty is a way in which we can evangelize too. How yeah. you're doing that mm -hmm. through Magnificat and through the events like yeah. this. Beauty is right. the key way. I mean, you, for just for example, you take the cover of Magnificat. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, Mr. Dumont personally chooses the covers, the publisher, mm -hmm. and they're so striking that even if I'm not inclined to read or subscribe mm -hmm. to a magazine, just so mm -hmm. moved by yes. uh, how beauty evokes wonder and makes me, I don't know, long for more that I want to open this book and say, okay, maybe there's more of the same inside. Mm. Yeah. Beauty is, is 
really so powerful as a, mm -hmm. web, as a tool of evangelization, yeah. yeah. How, how long does it actually take you for the materials that you, when putting together any particular month, I mean, how long does it actually, from the time you're working, how far ahead do you have to work on well, these editions? Well, we work six months ahead, okay. and we have a, a, a crackerjack team that works like clockwork, so everyone knows his or her deadline. The managing editor, Catherine Kolpak, is just at the top of her game in terms of bringing the master document together, et cetera. So um, we always try to, to get things in ahead of deadline, but it takes a little while, especially to find the meditations. So right. I, I always like to be a, at least a month or two ahead on those in the event that I'm going to come up against a kind of a tough reading that right. I can't find the exact right one for. Well, we are just out of time. And I noticed, uh, Father, that you are over at Dunwoody once in a while. Or yes, I live there. there. Yeah, yeah. And so we got to get you on Sunday Night Prime again. Sure, uh, yeah, happy with, to, yes. With Father Andrew Postley, and hopefully we'll see you then. Yeah, Thank you good. so much for your wonderful work. That's so uh, Father much. Peter John Cameron, OP. And he's the editor-in-chief of, of course, Magnificat, and you saw the play earlier today. We're going to take a break, and next up is Father Robert Barron. You won't want to miss it. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Magnificat. Uh, it's the Magnificat Day, Day of Joy. We take you right down. John Sacco's on stage, but we're going to be hearing from Father Robert Barron. Stay with us. Coming up now. Bless you all. Okay. And don't make me say it again. Mike Bishop. I got I tell you something real quick. There's a gentleman here who's a very, very good friend of Magnificat by the name of Mike Bishop. And <laughs> every so often he, he, he calls me up and we share, we share a good, a good uh, fellowship over the phone. And, but the thing is, I see his line come up as Bishop. <laughs> and for that moment, I get very, very nervous thinking, what have I done now? <laughs> but it's always a pleasure to talk to Mike Bishop. Okay, so now it is my pleasure to introduce another member of the Magnificat family, someone who is very well known to Magnificat readers. He writes a monthly essay for Magnificat, A Light Unto My Path. He is the author of the acclaimed video series, Catholicism, and he also founded and guides the Word on Fire Catholic Ministry which you can find out more about up in the exhibitors section. He is the rector and president of Mundelein Seminary of St. Mary of the Lake, and he is dedicated to forming good and holy priests, something for which we are all praying. You just did what I was going to ask you to do. I was going to say, let's give a round of applause to all the priests that have given up their time and talent today. them there's no confession and there's no Eucharist. <laughs> Father Barron, without further ado. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. That is very kind of you. Listen, I'm glad I'm here. I was at O'Hare Airport yesterday, and my flight was at 4 o'clock. Uh, I left at 8.15 from O'Hare. <laughs> so it was not a happy uh, journey, but I'm delighted 
to be here in Memphis. I've never been to Memphis before. And I'm a great music fan, so city of, of, of Johnny Cash and B.B. King and many others. That's exciting to me. <laughs> Elvis, too, comes to mind. <laughs> Graceland's out by the airport, huh? I've never been to Graceland. Maybe on the way home tomorrow I can stop by uh, Graceland. I'd love to see it. Listen, I first want to pay tribute to all the Magnificat people. Uh, I think Monsieur Dumont and Peter John Cameron are heroes of the new evangelization. I really do. I think Magnificat is one of the great gifts given to the church in the last uh, 25 years. So thank you to all the people involved with Magnificat. And what a classy day. I was here this day last year in uh, Philly. And to be here for the, with the Memphis Symphony Orchestra and all that beautiful music, they exemplify a principle that uh, Pope Benedict talked about and now Pope Francis talks about, which is the via pulchritudinis, the way of beauty. In a postmodern culture where the true and the good are often um, contested, that's your truth, but not mine. Beginning with the beautiful is often a winsome way in. And I think Magnificat has always stood for that. So God bless Magnificat, and thank you for having me today. You know, something actually as a speaker that I like, I like when the person who invites you gives you a topic. It's actually more helpful. And uh, Monsieur Dumont has done that both last year and this year. And this year about the saints resplendent in light. Of course, it's All Saints Day today, and sanctity, everybody, is what it's all about, right? The church's whole job is to produce holy people. So it's always a good topic to talk about, sanctity. But for a very special reason, I like the topic. Because of a new chapel we have at Mundelein Seminary, where I'm rector, it's the old house chapel in the students' building, which we just renovated. It had never been named for a saint. It was always just the house chapel, it had never been beautifully decorated. I decided to name it for St. John Paul II. Uh, we have a beautiful, iconic portrait of John Paul in there. But then we also had 19 windows that had always just been empty, plain windows. I wanted to fill them all with stained glass of great evangelical figures associated with John Paul. So it occurred to me, why not use some of those windows as visual aids in this talk? Now, if any of my students right now are watching, they're laughing because the running joke is that I'm like a tiresome father always showing pictures of his kids to everybody. <laughs> I'm always talking about the John Paul II Chapel, and like every annoying father, I have slides. And so <laughs> I brought you slides today, which I trust are going to be uh, rolling behind me as I talk. What I want to do is not talk about all 19 saints, don't get nervous. I'll just talk about seven of them. And <laughs> what I'm, you're just not my students now. Uh, what I'm going to do is a kind of um, phenomenological analysis. What I mean is we're going to walk around the phenomenon of holiness. It's very hard to define holiness. What does it mean to be a saint? What I propose to do is walk around holiness with the help of these seven figures, each one of which shows forth a particular profile or aspect of holiness. Okay, so that's the game. If you keep in score, we're going through seven saints, and I'll try to keep things uh, moving along. Here's the first one, St. Thomas Aquinas. Oh, you know, by the way, let me just say, I'm always happy to be among Dominicans. I love all the Dominicans here today. I'm a priest because of St. Thomas Aquinas, and I've always been uh, very much at home with Dominicans. In fact, a good friend of mine, Father Paul Murray, who's a great Dominican scholar in Rome, refers to me as an OP wannabe. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, St. Thomas Aquinas was the first window we put in the new chapel. As I say, he's the reason I'm a priest. When I was a 14-year-old kid at Fenwick High School outside Chicago, we came in from recess one sweaty afternoon, and uh, the young friar, introduced us to the quinque vie, the arguments for God's existence from Aquinas. And to this day, I'm still not entirely sure why it happened, but it was like a bell going off for me. It was convincing me of the reality of God in a way I never had been convinced before. And it's 
absolutely true to say I've never left the path I got on through the intervention of St. Thomas Aquinas when I was a kid of 14. So I want to uh, pay special tribute to him. Thomas obviously was, with Augustine, the greatest intellectual in the history of the church. But being an intellectual in itself is not tantamount to holiness, is it? I mean, very smart people can be wicked. So what was Thomas's holiness? Well, you can see it in the lower panel of the window. Each of our windows, we have the saint and his heavenly manifestation, but then in the lower panel, there's a scene from the life of the saint. At the very end of his life, when Thomas was in Naples, he was finishing up the section on the Eucharist, which is in the third part of the Summa Theologiae. And it's a masterpiece, the questions on the Eucharist. But Thomas finished the text, and he just wasn't sure he had done justice to this great sacrament. And so he put the text at the foot of the cross, an icon of the cross. In fact, last summer I was filming, we're doing a new series on the 10 pivotal players, one of whom is Aquinas. And I was privileged to get into that cell in Naples and to film right in there. And we saw the very icon before which Thomas placed the text. He put it there as though to ask for approbation. And according to the wonderful story, the voice comes from the cross. Bene scripsisti de me, Toma. Of course, Jesus spoke Latin to Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> well have you written of me, Thomas. And then he said, what would you have as a reward? To which Thomas replied, you can see it in the window, non nisi te, domine. I will have nothing, Lord, except you. Now, I always tell my students, if and when you hear a voice saying, what do you want, that's the right answer. <laughs> but now, I don't mean that flippantly at all, because this cuts very close to the heart of what it means to be a saint. We have all kinds of desires, right? In a few hours, we'll all be desiring a dinner. Tomorrow morning at the airport, I'll be desiring the plane goes back on time. Uh, we desire a, a suit of clothes or a car or whatever. We have all kinds of desires. But underneath and through all those small desires, there's a great desire. There's a hunger of the heart, which is a desire not for any particular thing, but the desire for joy, for peace, for meaning. To be a saint is, first of all, to awaken that desire. Now, mind you, there's the principal problem with our secularist society, a secularist ideology that says that question doesn't exist. It's only an illusion. It's not important. We got to fight that. We got to fight it in the schools. We got to fight it in the culture. We got to fight it in the streets if we have to. We have to fight for the legitimacy of that question. But then, we have to hook it onto its proper object. As Augustine said long ago, long before Thomas, Lord, you've made us for yourself, and therefore our heart is restless until it rests in thee. The deepest longing of the heart can be satisfied only by God. What's the central tragedy of life when we hook that infinite desire for God onto something less than God? Thomas Aquinas, by the way, named the four principal mistakes that we make. We tend to hook that desire onto wealth, pleasure, power, or honor. Somehow those four things or some combination of them are going to fill up the longing of the heart. Of course they can't. When we try, what happens? We become frustrated, divided, deeply unhappy. I came across an article uh, not long ago in Rolling Stone magazine about Don Johnson. Remember Don Johnson from the 1980s, Miami Vice and all that, where he was probably the biggest TV star in the world. He was right now he's in his mid-60s somewhere, and he was reminiscing about those days. And he said, I remember one night there was a great party at my mansion, and my mansion included a kind of like its own a special bay in which several yachts were kept. And I was out in the balcony, he said, with a drink in my hand, looking out at this great scene of all the beautiful people partying on my three separate yachts. I had everything, 
wealth, pleasure, power, honor, influence. And he said, as he was standing there at the height of his powers, why am I so miserable? That's a great story. In some ways, it's the flip side of Aquinas' non nisi te domine. What do you want? What do you want? You know, when Jesus turns on the disciples that were sent by John the Baptist, and he says, what are you looking for? That's a great question. Every one of us should imagine the Lord Jesus turning on us and saying, what do you want? He's not asking about some little desire. He's asking about that most abiding desire of the heart. What do you want? What do you want? The only right answer, the answer of the saint is, I want nothing except you. Once that's clarified, look what happens, everybody. Then I know what to do with wealth, pleasure, power, and honor. If I don't have my central desire clarified, then Don Johnson, wealth, pleasure, power, and honor are going to turn on me. Once you know what you want, only you, Lord, then your life becomes like a beautiful rose window with one thing in the center and everything else revolving beautifully and harmoniously around it. Now, that's the saint's life. That's the well-integrated life. I'll give Kierkegaard the last word. He said a saint is someone whose life is about one thing. It's really good, isn't it? He doesn't mean his life is monotonous, uninteresting, anything but. His life's about one thing. What do you want? Nothing except you. There's the first profile of holiness from Thomas Aquinas. Second one, from Thérèse of Lisieux. What a privilege that we have. Uh, her relics are here, aren't they? Not just her, her parents. Last time in Philly, I think the relics of her parents. Is that right? The, the little flowers relics are here. Is that right? It's just amazing. It's amazing. The little flower... Um, what a miracle that she's become such an important player in the life of the church. Given how restricted her life was, how short her life was, she dies at 24, known at the time to her fellow sisters and a few family members, right? You know that delicious story that, that when she died and they had to write a little biography to send to the other Carmelites in France, one of her sisters said, what will we say about her? They, they didn't, how, would, how will we say anything about this little simple life? And yet, within a decade of her death, she's a figure of enormous international significance, becoming eventually a doctor of the church because of John Paul II. That's why I put her in the chapel, because John Paul makes her a doctor of the church. You know, I have to confess that um, when I first read the story of the soul, her great uh, autobiography, I was, like a lot of people, kind of nonplussed by it. I thought, you know, it's a little twee, a little sentimental. Uh, it, it didn't grab me the way a lot of spiritual masterpieces grab me. And the turning point was when I was in Paris doing my doctoral studies, and my um, thesis director is a great man named Michel Corbin, a Jesuit priest. I think uh, Monsieur Dumont knows him. And um, one day in the seminar, I had used the phrase in regard to Therese, la petite fleur, the little flower. And he right away corrected me and said, well, in France we don't say la petite fleur, we say la petite Thérèse. She's the little Thérèse, as opposed to la grande Thérèse, who is Teresa of Avila, right? But then Corbin said something, he kind of winked at me, and he said, but after many years of reading la petite Thérèse, I realize elle est vraiment la grande Thérèse. She's truly the great Teresa. I remember sitting there somewhere thinking, I better take a second look at this, <laughs> at this figure. Well, indeed I did, and I must say it was one of the turning points in my life, spiritually. And Therese, I think now, indeed, is a great doctor of the church, one of the great masters of the spiritual life, a saint of enormous importance for me, personally, my work at Word on Fire, she's our patroness, etc. So with Thomas Aquinas, she's for me the greatest of the saints. How would I name the profile of holiness that she shows forth? Well, it's the famous little way. Now, I know right away there's a problem, isn't it? The little way. <laughs> the little way. You know, again, it sounds very twee and cute and sentimental. It's not. In fact, the little way cuts, again, like Aquinas' insight, right to the heart of the spiritual thing. 
What's the little way? I could state it abstractly this way. It is responding every moment to the demand of love. What's the demand of love? Respond to it. Every moment, even in the simplest way, respond to the demand of love. What's love? It's not a feeling. It's so important we get this right spiritually. It's not a sentiment. It can be accompanied by that. Nothing against feeling and sentiment. They're great. But love is not a feeling. Love is an act of the will, says Thomas Aquinas. For to love is to will the good of the other as other. Stay with that for a second, because it'll change your life if you let it sink in. To will the good of the other as other. See, not like I'll be nice to you that you might be nice to me. That's what a lot of us do. That's just indirect egotism, right? If I'm nice to you, then you'll return the favor and be nice to me. I'm just serving myself through you. That's not love. Love is breaking out of the black hole of my own self-regard and saying, I really want your good. Loving, willing the good of the other as other. The little way is to live that every day in every situation. You know the great stories in the story of the soul that exemplify it, I love. And one of them we symbolize in the window. We have an image of these two little shoes. Remember that story? Therese on um, Christmas Eve went with her family, as was the custom, to midnight mass. They all came home to the little house there, the Buissonnet in Lisieux. And the custom of the Martin house was the kids put their shoes around the fireplace. Then the father would put little treats and goodies in the shoes. It was a custom that Therese loved. Well, when she was about 14, she comes back from Midnight Mass, excited about this little ritual. As she's going up the stairs, she hears her father say, well, thank God, this is the last year we're going to do this. Now, normally, this would have devastated her. She would have dissolved in tears. She would have been, been hurt beyond words. But she decided it's Christmas morning, the day of Christ's birth, and Christ wants to be born in me. And so I'm going to go down those stairs. I'm going to forget what my father said. I'm going to go down joyfully, lovingly, and involve myself in this, in this ritual. Now you say, who cares? What a silly little story. No serious biographer would ever pay a bit of attention to it, right? But see, Therese understood that in the spiritual order, things are turned upside down. Because in the spiritual order, that little scene sums up everything. It was a revolution in the spiritual order, more important than the conquering of great empires. It was the setting aside of the old self and allowing Christ to be born in her. That's the little way. The other story, of course, we all know, and I love it, is she's now a fully professed religious. She's at the Carmel, and she's assigned this cranky old nun, and her job is to, is to wheel her down to the dining room to get her set at the table to cut her meat, etc., take care of her. And this cranky old nun just could not be more difficult. She didn't want this Therese. She didn't like her. She didn't think she was up to the job. She reminded Therese over and over again all the things she was doing wrong. When she got to the table, she wasn't set up right. My knife should be on the other side. That napkin is all wrong. No, you're cutting the meat wrong. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> At that moment, Therese said she imagined that the room had been transformed into a great Parisian ballroom filled with couples twirling and dance, beautiful music being played, delicious food everywhere, and she heard this music of that place in her mind. But then she said, no, I don't want to be there. I want to be right here, right now, with this difficult old nun. Because right here, right now, I can perform an act of love. That's the little way. And it's really the big way. See what I'm saying? She's really the grand Therese. That's really the big way. 
the only way that matters. See, think everybody, what if you woke up in the morning and said, my goal today is not to aggrandize my ego, it's not to get more wealth, pleasure, power, honor, not to make people think I'm great, not to defend, none of that. What if I woke up and said, my goal today is to love as fully and dramatically as I can. Can I submit to you, your whole life would change. Your whole life would change. I love this from uh, Origen, the great church father. He reflects on the book of Exodus. Remember when Pharaoh has enslaved the Israelites, and he has them do two things. He has them build fortified cities and monuments to himself, right? Well, here's Origen's reflection. That's what most of us do most of the time in our sin, is I'm going to fortify my ego, defend it, and build monuments to it. <laughs> hey, look at me. And if you're, if you're coming after me, build a fort around me. What a waste of time. What if every day you said, I want to find the most dramatic way to love? You know what you turn into, actually? You turn into a woman who took her name from Therese of Lisieux, I'm talking about Teresa of Calcutta. When I was privileged to film in Calcutta, we got into Mother Teresa's cell. And as you'd expect, it's a little nothing of a place with a kind of a picnic table bench in one corner, nothing on the walls, except in the front, on the left, a little framed photograph of Therese of Lisieux. Now, you remember Mother Teresa's line, the great saint of the slums of Calcutta, don't worry about doing great things, but do little things with great love. That's right out of the little way. There's a second profile of holiness. Here's the third. I associate it with St. Paul. We put Paul in our chapel because he's John Paul II, and because I can't think of a more Pauline character than John Paul, can you? What I mean is someone that traveled the whole world as an evangelist. That's right, we have in Paul's hands the scroll that says, woe to me if I do not evangelize, I do not preach the gospel. In many ways, he's the first of the church's great evangelizers. But for our purposes today, I want to focus on another saying of St. Paul. He says to the Galatians, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Like the little way, like the non nisi te domine, it's one of those lines that will change your whole life if you let it sink in. Does anybody think, when you read Romans and 1 and 2 Corinthians, uh, Thessalonians, Galatians, Philippians, do you ever get the impression that Paul's personality has been put on hold or marginalized, set aside? That Paul's become a kind of automaton, that his personality has been muted? Come on, he's one of the liveliest figures in the Bible. You can, his, his words crackle, they jump off the page. You can hear Paul's voice in an instant, can't you? It's no longer I who live. He's not talking about putting to death his personality. What he's talking about is the opening up of a deeper and richer identity. Allowing Christ to live his life in him. See, for us Christians, Christ is so much more than a moral exemplar, a teacher, a guide, you know, I mean, to say that is, is so understated as to miss the point. Rather, Christ is a field of force. He's a power in which we live. He doesn't say, just imitate me. He says, eat my body and drink my blood. Take my very life blood into you so that it's no longer you who live, but I who live in you. That's Christianity. Can I put it in terms of um, Hans Urs von Balthasar, John Paul's and Benedict's favorite theologian? Balthasar said, the key to the saintly life is making the transition from the ego drama to the theodrama. What's the ego drama? That's the drama that I'm producing, 
I'm directing, and above all, I'm starring in it, <laughs> right? <laughs> Here's the Father Robert Barron show on the road in Memphis. Here's my supporting cast for the moment. See, but the trouble is, fellow sinners, that's what we all do. It's true, though, isn't it? That's what we, most of the time, is, well, it's, it's my show. The world's revolving around me. One of the great insights in the spiritual life is your life is not about you. To come to that is, is to have your life changed. My life is not about me. What's the theodrama? That's the drama that's been produced, directed by God. We have a role in it. Might it have anything to do with the role that we envision in the theodrama or in the ego drama? The important thing is I've handed myself over to a power already at work in me that can do infinitely more than I can ask or imagine. That's Ephesians, isn't it? See, the trouble with, it, with the ego drama is it's so boring. <laughs> See, this sin, I know we glamorize it. Look at the movies. Glam the thing about sin, though, everybody, it's, it's dull. Well, here's my life according to my projects, my plans. Here's what I got in mind for myself. Oh. You know what I'm saying? It, what, what do I know? What do I know about what my life... There's a power already at work in you that can do infinitely more than you can ask or imagine. Surrender to it. The power of the Holy Spirit. Let God set the agenda for your life. Let God write the drama. And then the fun of it is discovering your role in it. That, by the way, is the pearl of great price. When you find it, sell everything you've got and buy it. That's the treasure buried in the field. If you find that treasure, get rid of every little bit of the ego drama. Who needs it? And buy that field. Attain that treasure. It's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. There's a great scene in Man for All Seasons I love. Not one of the real famous ones. It's toward the beginning of the play, the beginning of the movie. It's about Richard Rich. Remember? He's the man who eventually turns on Thomas More. But in the beginning of the play, he's this young kid just out of Cambridge. He's about 19 or 20. And he's looking for a position. And he's hanging around Thomas More because More is a big dealer in the court of Henry VIII. And so if I hang around him, I might get a job. And so he cajoles and he asks and he begs. And finally, Thomas More says, I've got a job for you. You do? What is it? There's an opening in the local school. And Rich says, a teacher? I mean, he wants to be among the glitterati in the court of Henry VIII. He might be a local teacher. More says, you'd be a good teacher, perhaps a great one. And Rich fires back, and if I were, who would know it? And see, that's the ego drama, right? I, I want to be famous. I got my plans. I want people to admire me. Moore's patient answer is, yourself? Your friends, your pupils, God. Not a bad public, that. <laughs> See, that's the voice of the theodrama. Whom are we playing for? What audience? The only audience worth playing for, finally, is the divine audience. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Fourth saint. Maybe not as well known as the first three, but one that was very important to John Paul II. I'm talking about blessed Pier Giorgio Frassati. You know, he's the patron of World Youth Day. So he's buried in uh, Torino, his hometown, but when they have World Youth Day, they fly the remains of Frassati to the site of World Youth Day so the kids can venerate him. Um, born in 1901 in Turin, as I mentioned, his parents were well known. His mother was a well known painter. His father was the editor of La Stampa, still one of the biggest papers in Italy. And eventually his father became the Italian ambassador to Germany. So a very uh, significant family, wealthy family, prominent socially. His parents, though, were not cat ardent Catholics. His father was more or less an agnostic. His mother was a vaguely interested Catholic. But strangely, this son of theirs, Pier Giorgio, has this deep intuition for the spiritual world. He spends long nights before the Blessed Sacrament. In fact, when he became a teenager, 
his parents didn't know where he was at night. They thought he was out carousing. And they went to the, the priest and said, where is he? <laughs> Relax, he's in church. You know? They didn't believe him. During the day, Fursati gave himself radically to service of the poor. He became a third-order Dominican, by the way. Dominicans know about him. He took the name Fra Girolamo, Brother Girolamo. And under that name, that's, that's how the poor people of Turin knew him, he ministered to them. There are many stories about his, um, his personal poverty. Whatever money his parents gave him, he gave right away. If he had a train ticket, he'd give that away to someone who didn't have one. Then he would run home to be there on time at the dinner table. One of his friends said to him, how come you always you know, ride third class? You're a wealthy guy. He said, because there's no fourth class on the train. When he was a little guy, they say a, a, a woman with a young son came begging to their door, and the young son had no shoes. And just spontaneously, Pier Giorgio took off his own shoes and gave them to the, the kid with no shoes. He had this deep instinct for prayer and a deep instinct for the poor, which is why in our window we have him holding a, a loaf of bread. It's in that capacity that he died because he contracted a virulent form of polio, and it killed him in about four days. Before his family even knew that he was, he was sick, he had died. But here's a wonderful part of his story. John Paul loved this. At his funeral, his parents expected the wealthy, the upper class to come because he was a son of a famous family. By the thousands, though, the poor of Turin came, filling the streets of the city to pay homage to him. But they didn't realize that he was from a wealthy family. They just knew him as Brother Girolamo, who took care of them. They were shocked to discover how wealthy he was. And so the two groups met, his wealthy parents and the army of the poor, and they both met with incomprehension because this Pier Giorgio Frassati had brought those two worlds together. Now, here's the one thing I want to focus on. This is the fourth profile of holiness I want you to see. In almost all the photos of Frasati that we have, he's smiling. He's with his friends. He's something of a good time Charlie. I don't mean that at all dismissively. Someone that loved to celebrate, loved to spend time with his friends. He was an outdoorsman, a hiker, and above all, a mountain climber. There's a famous photo of him, and it shows him on this sheer cliff face. You can't see the bottom. You can't see where he's going. And there he's climbing. And on that photo, he wrote his motto, which is verso l'alto, to the heights, to the heights. Here's what I want you to see. Real holiness does no damage to nature, but rather elevates and perfects nature. Again, isn't it Thomas Aquinas that says, grace presupposes and perfects nature. Friends, it's a great Catholic principle, isn't it? Newman reminds us, correctly, there's an ascetical principle within Catholicism because we have to discipline our lower nature. That means our sinful nature. So yes, there are ascetical practices. But, but asceticism never amounts to games of dualism or Manichaeism or Puritanism. We never do war against nature. Rather, we allow grace to elevate what is best in us. What is true and good and beautiful in our nature gets elevated, perfected. That's one reason why I put Frasati's window front and center in our chapel. I tell our students all the time, God chose you to be a priest. And what I mean is <laughs> he chose you with your particular gifts, your particular personality. All that's beautiful and life-giving and fun and true and right in you, he chose, and he wants to sanctify and elevate that. If you find yourself playing the game of doing damage to your nature, that's not the game of a saint. Grace elevates and perfects nature. Here's the image for it, everybody. If you let the full implication of this stay in your mind, you get my whole talk. In the Bible, in the book of Exodus, when the true God appears to Moses, he appears in a bush that is on fire but not consumed. 
right? When the true God comes close, he makes the world radiant and beautiful and does not consume it. You see what I'm saying? Contrast, by the way, the book of Exodus to uh, Greek and Roman myths. When the gods make their appearance in the human realm, what happens? People are incinerated. (laughs) People blow up. Things are destroyed because the gods come crashing competitively into the world. It's not the case in the Bible. The true God takes our nature, lights it up, makes it radiant and beautiful, and does not consume it. There's the fourth face of holiness I want you to see. Number five is associated with St. John of the Cross. John of the Cross was very important to Karol Wojtyla, you know. When he was a young man, he came under the influence of Jan Tiranowski. Read George Weigel's great biography for all the details here. Jan Tiranowski was a layman, but he formed a lot of these young kids in Krakow in the Catholic spiritual life. He taught them especially the Carmelite tradition, John of the Cross. Later now, when Karol Wojtyla goes to Rome to get his doctorate, he does his first doctoral paper on St. John of the Cross. As Weigel says, I think correctly, Karol Wojtyla very much had a Carmelite soul. Now, what was it he saw in John of the Cross? Well, in our window, we have him holding a scroll that makes reference to the famous Noche Oscura, right? The dark night. How oughtn't we to construe the dark night? We oughtn't to construe it as a type of depression. Too often it's read that way. I'm going through the dark night of the soul. I'm going through a time of depression. That is not it. John the Cross talks about the dark night of the senses and the dark night of the soul or of the spirit. What he's talking about everybody is this ancient and enduring spiritual theme of detachment, detachment. The Greek fathers talk about apatheia, not apathy in that negative sense. It means a detachment from the goods of the world. Ignatius of Loyola, a contemporary John of the Cross, refers to indifferencia, doesn't he? Indifference, but not in a negative way. He means detachment. Lord, whether I have a long life or short life, I don't care. Lord, whether I'm healthy or sick, I don't care, as long as I'm serving you. Now, now, this is very much congruent with what I said about Thomas Aquinas. It's congruent with Augustine, too. John of the Cross says that we have in us these infinite caverns, he called them. What he meant was the infinite capacity for God, the hunger for God. What's the tragedy of life? Well, first of all, secularism. He said, we simply cover the caverns over, pretend they're not there. That's the secularist ideology. But the other problem more common, the other solution more common, is we take finite things, we take worldly things, and we throw them into the caverns, hoping to fill them up. Wealth, pleasure, power, honor, right? If I just get enough wealth, I'll be happy. So I throw wealth into the cavern. Just if I have enough pleasure, I'll be happy. So I throw pleasure after pleasure in. What happens though? (laughs) You can throw all the wealth, all the pleasure, all the power of the world into these caverns, they won't do anything to fill them up because the caverns are infinite. It's like, oh. I, I, I got to put more wealth in. Oh. Uh, pleasure, that's the thing. I need more pleasure. Oh. Does, that, does that resonate, though, with your fellow sinners? Because we're all in this. What did Chesterton say? We're all in the same boat. We're all seasick, right? But, <laughs> we all play this game. If I just get enough, fill in the blank, I'll be happy. No, that'll never make you happy. It's only in God. Non nisi te, Domine. Same principle. So, John of the Cross, like so many others, teaches the path of detachment. What's an attachment? Here's his answer. Anything in this world 
including your own life, that you're convinced you can't live without. That's a great definition. Again, that'll change your life if you get it. Anything in this world, including your own life, that you're convinced you can't live without. Remember the Lord Jesus himself says what? Don't be afraid of those who can kill the body and do nothing else. Remember that? <laughs> what in the world? Isn't that the most frightening thing possible? Someone kill my... The Lord says, don't be afraid of those paper tigers that can just take your life and can do nothing else. An attachment is anything in this world that we're convinced we can't live without. There's a great image for this. It goes way back to the Middle Ages. Longer than that, but it was, it was popular as a device in the medieval cathedrals. It's called the Wheel of Fortune. The Wheel of Fortune, you can see long before the game show, there was the spiritual thing. And you see it on the walls and in the windows of many medieval churches, and it's, it's a great circle. At the top of the circle, there's a, a king, and he says, Regno, right? I'm reigning. Now the circle turns this way, and there's a king having lost his crown, and he says, Regnavi, I have reigned. Circle turns here at the bottom, there's a pauper, and he says, Sum sine regno, I am without any kind of power. Then the circle turns up here, and there's a guy climbing to the top, and he says, Regnabo, I shall reign. What is the wheel of fortune? It's life. Right? What did Frank Sinatra say? I'm riding high in April, shot down in May, right? That's for people now, it's for the older set now, the Frank Sinatra. Uh, it's life. The wheel turns. Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. In terms of wealth, pleasure, power, honor, sometimes I've got it. But what's the one thing I know when I'm at the top of the wheel of fortune? Is it's not going to stay, right? It'll turn. I'll, I'll lose wealth, pleasure, honor, power. And then sometimes it turns so dramatically that I'm out of all those things. And then, then other times I'm coming back up the ladder. I'm getting back to the top. Okay, what's the point? The point is to live your life on the rim of the wheel is to live in constant fear. Right? You might say, especially at the top of the wheel of fortune, Ay, 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 when am I going to lose? Mr. Regnabo over here, he wants to kick me out. Especially at the top of the Wheel of Fortune, I'm afraid. When I'm losing my power, of course I'm afraid. When I, when I have nothing, of course I'm, I'm in fear. And even when I'm climbing up, am I going to make it or not? I don't know. See, the whole rim of the wheel is a place of fear. And then, right in the middle of the wheel, there's a depiction of Christ. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Christ who links us to the eternity of God. And the whole point now of this exercise is live your life in the center of the wheel, not on the rim. See, what's apatheia, indifferentia, detachment, is living your life in the center of the wheel so that you can watch the wheel go round and round with a certain detachment. I, I'm, not, I'm not married to having it all, having nothing, gaining, losing. I'm grounded in Christ, and I can watch the wheel go round. There's detachment, and it's the path, everybody, of liberty. I'll say one more word about that before I close, but that's the path of liberty. And I think detachment is one of the great faces of holiness. Okay. Number six, we're getting there. Number six. Cyril and Methodius, uh, these great ninth century figures, very important to John Paul II. They were the um, apostles to the Slavic nations. So they're the reason why Karol Wojtyla eventually became a Christian, because uh, the Slavs were evangelized by these brothers, born in Thessalonica in Greece the city that Paul himself evangelized, wrote the letters to the Thessalonians. Many centuries later, these brothers emerged and they became great missionaries. John Paul declared them co-patrons of Europe, which is why in our window we have a little map of Europe on top there. Here's a dimension I want you to see with these two saints. 
the missionary dimension. The missionary dimension. Here's something in the Bible. There's no exception to it. Nobody in the Bible is ever given an experience of God without being sent. No exception. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, Samuel, David, Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Peter, James, John, all of them. There's no exception. Christianity is not a Platonic mysticism where the idea is just to rise up to union with the, with the absolute. It's a missionary religion. When you're given an experience of God, it's not just for you. It's so that God can now speak through you to the wider world. You've been sent on mission. Here's again from von Balthasar. Have you noticed how the beautiful has this centrifugal quality? What I mean is, when you experience something beautiful, a beautiful person, a beautiful place, a beautiful film, a beautiful work of art, what's your instinct? Right, tell people about it. You bubble over. You got to see this movie. Man. You got look at this picture. You got to see this. Balsar says that the beautiful seizes us. You know, we talk about aesthetic arrest when you're stopped in your tracks by something beautiful. It seizes us and then sends us on mission. What's the most beautiful thing of all? God becoming one of us. Christ Jesus. Don't you see it now on every page of the New Testament? It's the dynamic energy behind every utterance in the New Testament. Is I got to tell you about this Jesus. I always call it the grab you by the lapels quality of the Bible, right? Is these aren't just uh, you know blandly um, uh, philosophical musings. Th these are writings by people that want to grab the whole world by the lapels and tell them about this Jesus. That's what the beautiful does. It sends you on mission. Think of that wonderful scene, Isaiah chapter six, the prophets in the temple. And suddenly he sees a vision of Yahweh. There he is on a high and mighty throne, and yet his train fills the temple. The temple is filled with smoke. The, the door frame shakes with the presence of the divine majesty. Isaiah is overwhelmed. That's the experience of God. He says, it happened in the year that King Uzziah died. What I love about that is he remembers distinctly when it was. It was so overwhelming an event. Everyone in this room has had something like that or we wouldn't be here, right? Some moment when God broke into our lives powerfully. Good. That's the experience of God. But then what does Isaiah say right away? Lord, leave me. I, I'm a man of unclean lips among a people of unclean lips. That's code for I, I'm a sinner. I, I can't bear your presence. And of course the Lord beautifully purges, he, he sears his lips with the charcoal, and then he sends him. He sends him. Here I am, Lord, Isaiah says, send me. There's a beautiful parallel scene in the New Testament. It's when Jesus gets into Peter's boat, remember, without being asked or invited. That's how it works with grace, right? <laughs> grace invades. We don't ask for it. It doesn't come on our terms. It invades our lives. The miraculous draft of fishes. That beautiful thing when Peter, the skilled fisherman, Lord, look, we've been at it all night. I know what I'm doing here, and we haven't found anything. Sounds the same boat. We're all seasick. Hey, hey, I'm in charge here. It's my drama. I know what I'm doing. Look, pal, you, you don't have a clue what you're doing. That's the, that's the great thing about grace. And so Jesus gets in the boat. He starts giving commands. Thank God St. Peter listened to him. And then he brings in the miraculous draft of fishes. By the way, by the way, when you cooperate with grace, you'll have more life than you can handle. That's the point there. The boat's almost sinking from the life that's come aboard. That's what happens when we cooperate with grace. Stop playing the silly ego drama game and play the Theo drama game. You'll have more life than you can handle. What's Peter's reaction? Same as Isaiah's. Lord, leave me, I'm a sinful man. I know you're a sinner. 
I forgive your sin, and now I'm going to make you a fisher of men. He sends Peter on mission. Baltar says, we don't know who we are until we find our mission. That's why very often in the Bible, once you find your mission, you get a new name. Because now you know who you are. Often when people join religious communities, they get new names. Because now they know who they are for the first time. You know the trouble with our postmodern society? I alluded to it already, but you know, your truth, my truth, your good, my good, I'll tolerate you, you tolerate me. You know the trouble with that? Again, how tiresome and tedious and boring it all becomes. I've said we're like, we're like individuals lying on our little air mattresses in this big, lazy lake that's going nowhere. We're vaguely tolerating everybody else. But wh what are we about? Where are we going? What's our mission? Oh, mission. I don't know the mission. <laughs> John Henry Newman said that water flows fast when it flows between well-established banks. You see what he means? When, when the banks are clear, you know what, what the mission is, then the water moves with a certain purpose. Mary, once the angel appeared to her, proceeded in haste into the hill country. She knew just what to do. That's the sign of someone that's got a mission. That's another face of holiness. Oh, we just made one more word about that. I promise I'll stop at four, though. Um, freedom, freedom, freedom. What's freedom? Well, our society says freedom from external constraint so I can find freedom for self-expression, right? Don't tread on me. Don't tell me what to do. I determine my life. That's not biblical freedom. What's biblical freedom? It's freedom from attachment. So I can find freedom for doing the will of God. It's, now I know my mission, and I, I've so rid myself of attachment that I can perform the mission. I can move in haste. It's for freedom that Christ has set you free, says Paul. What else does Paul say? I am the slave of Christ Jesus. <laughs> now, that doesn't make a lick of sense to people in our society. It makes perfect biblical sense, doesn't it? To be a slave of Christ Jesus is to find real freedom. Okay, let's just do one more. Number seven, the great Padre Miguel Pro. Padre Pro, you know, died in 1927 during that terrible uh, persecution in Mexico. When the church, you know, in the lifetime of some people in this room, the church underwent a, a horrific uh, persecution. Padre Pro, uh, as far as we know, is the first martyrdom ever to be photographed. And not by accident. The um, officials wanted this death to be recorded so as to strike fear in the hearts of Catholic Mexico. Uh, I think it's fair to say their plan backfired. Because famously, and we see it in the lower scene in the window, Padre Pro, assuming the attitude of the crucified Jesus as the bullets are being fired, shouts out, Vive el Cristo Rey, right? Long live Christ the King. And he shouted it defiantly in the faces of those who were fighting for other kings. Now here's the thing, it's the final uh, profile of sanctity I want you to see. A saint is somebody who declares that Christ is his or her king. The Bible can be seen as a story of God becoming king precisely through human regents, human viceroys, if you want. Adam is a kind of king. He becomes a bad king, and that's where the trouble starts. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, Samuel, David, Solomon, etc., are all kingly figures. Their job is so to order Israel that it becomes again a garden, a place where God is rightly praised. Bad kingship is always the problem in Israel, isn't it? And so Israel longs for a definitive king. Whom do we find in Jesus? Precisely this longed-for figure. In Jesus, God has come to reign 
as king. What a strange king he is, though. His throne is a cross. His crown is a crown of thorns. But look, isn't it still, yeah, right here. Pontius Pilate becomes unwittingly, ironically, the first great evangelist. Because he puts over that cross, that instrument of torture, that was meant to cow the world into submission. If you cross us, pun intended, that's what we'll do to you, right? But Pilate puts on that cross the sign, Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judeorum, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Any first century Jew would have known to be king of the Jews was by extension to be king of the world because he was the one through whom Yahweh was becoming the rightful king. And so Pilate, in the three great languages of that time and place, Hebrew, Latin, and Greek, announces to the whole world, you've got a new king. Paul understood this in his bones, which is why over and over again in his writings and his preaching, he says, Jesus Curios. Jesus is the Lord. We can gloss over that. Oh, it's just nice, pious language. Jesus is Lord. But yeah, it was subversive language in Paul's time. Because the watchword was Kaiser Curios. Caesar's the Lord. That means the one to whom final allegiance is due. You'd greet someone by saying, Kaiser Curios. He'd respond, Kaiser Curios. We're, we're in this together. Caesar's our Lord. Do you see why Paul spent so much time in jail? <laughs> because he kept saying over and over again, even though they beat him and they stoned him, Jesus Curios. In fact, it's not Caesar, but someone that Caesar put to death is the true king. And announcing that is precisely what we mean by evangelization. That again is a, is a, a classical term. Euangelion in Greek means glad tidings, right? Well, see, when the emperor won a great battle, he would send evangelists ahead with the euangelion that, hey, the emperor's won a great battle. You see how edgy the first Christians were when they said, no, 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 no. We got the true euangelion. We're the true evangelists because we're announcing that's the king and that's the one who's won the definitive battle. I love that about evangelization, both old and new, because it's the same thing today. Padre Pro knew it. In the face of a culture turned demonic, he shouted, even as the bullets were coming at him, Viva el Cristo Rey! Christ is the king. And it's a great defiant challenge to all false pretenders to kingship. And so the church, even now to this day, has to stand up and say, Vive el Cristo Rey. We are those people who said, Christ is the king of our lives. The Dominus, right? That translates curios into Latin. And I like it because Dominus. See, Christ wants to dominate us. Oh, no, no, I don't. He's an interesting figure. I learned from him, and he's intriguing. No, 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 no. As I said in the, in, the, in the Catholicism series, that's Deepak Chopra or someone. That's fine. I mean, it's fine to read a, a self-help guy or something. But that ain't Jesus. Jesus is the dominus. He's the curios. He's the king, which means he wants to be the king of every aspect of my life. My mind, my will, my passions, my inner life, my outer life, my sexuality, my friendships, my political life. He wants to be king of everything. We say from the depth of our own being, vive el Cristo Rey. Some time ago, this uh, a priest friend of mine said, you know, I, we should update the Feast of Christ the King. You know, it's just so old-fashioned. We don't like kings. There aren't any kings around. We just say Christ the President. You know? <laughs> and uh, no, 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 no. I said, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I'm an American. I, I think it's great that every four years we have a chance to vote on the president, and if we don't like political leaders, we can get rid of them. That's great. I'm all for it. But see, Christ ain't the president. He's the king, because I can't vote him out. Like, it's the ego drama, and I, I'm sick of him now. I'm gonna... No, no, he's the king. He's the king of every aspect of your life. That's what it means to be a saint. 
Okay, let me close it now with uh, just a review for you. These seven profiles. A saint is someone who's clarified that fundamental desire. Non nisite domine. A saint is someone who practices the little way every moment to find the path of love. A saint is someone who allows Christ to live his life in him or in her. Fourth, a saint is someone who offers his nature to be transfigured by grace. Fifth, a saint is someone who walks the path of detachment. Six, a saint is someone who knows and accepts her mission. Finally, a saint is someone who allows Christ to be king. See, here's the thing, everybody. I'll close with it. Why are we concerned about this? Well, because it's the heart of the church. The church's job is to make saints. And finally, because we want to be among that number, don't we, when the saints go marching in. (laughs) God bless you all. Thanks for listening today. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I think. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Live, the day of joy, and it's coming to you live from the Memphis Cook Convention Center. I'm Doug Keck. We're going to take a break. Much more ahead. Stay with us. are back. I'm Doug Keck here, joined on set from our Magnificat event in Memphis, Tennessee, with Father Joseph Mary Wolf, who of course is our chaplain at EWTN. We just saw a wonderful, wonderful talk by Father Robert Barron. Now we're joined on set by two very, very important people when it comes to the Magnificat and the Magnificat Foundation. We have the president and co-founder, Pierre-Marie Dumont, who in collaboration with the diocese has brought it here and of course that's a magnificent foundation and we're joined once again by Roman Luzet who uh, is the vice president of uh, dealing with the magazine itself the actual publishing here so let's talk a little bit with Mr. Dumont since you was really your vision for the Magnificat magazine and the foundation where did the vision come from to decide to start the Magnificat magazine in France back in, what is it, 1992 or so? In the, in the beginning, it was a, a, a very little vision. <laughs> <laughs> like Father Robert Baron says that uh, we need to have a very little vision with, with big love, like yes. Thérèse de Lisieux. Yes. <laughs> it is the same thing. Mm-hmm. Because in the beginning, I, I, I have the idea of Magnificat when I was praying with my wife. And uh, we begin, she prayed with the liturgy of our, the old liturgy. And she have uh, five books and she, <laughs> she, 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 uh, she, she looks for, uh, uh, she she looks for the, the third Sunday of the third uh, semen yes. to the moon, to the, it was very complicated. It's difficult and very lengthy, yes, uh, yes. the divine office. And, and at this time, we have uh, ten, ten, bo- ten, 10 children, and uh, we have a, a life very, uh, very uh, full very of, uh, yes. of uh, activity. Yes. <laughs> and all the evening, she, she wants to play with the theater, and, and I say, no, I cannot, I have my... Uh, my work, I have my, my, my office, I come back uh, very, uh, very tired, uh, very tired <laughs> and it was difficult. Mm-hmm. And, with, uh, and when she pray, I was with the children because I have always one children who are in bed, but uh, when she sh- his mother pray, yes. she come back to uh, he continue to the to the fridge to take the chocolate, uh, oh, yes. <laughs> the rice and the chocolate, and, uh, and it was terrible. 
And uh, uh, when my mom we say, okay, stop. You have to pray together, not to pray uh, each with uh, la plus belle prière du monde. La plus belle prière du monde pour des époux. Si elle n'est pas commune, ce n'est pas une belle prière. Hey, sorry, so switching between French and English, saying that the most beautiful prayer for a couple, if it's not prayed as a couple, then there's something missing in that prayer. Mm -hmm. So the divine office was something too lengthy and too difficult with ten children for you to accomplish together, but you wanted to pray together. Yes, we were. Absolutely. So, we, we know that is the first thing to separate us is don't pray together. Mm. Yes. And it is sure. We, I, I saw many friends, it begins like that. Mm -hmm. They have two spiritual lives separate. Oh, fantastic spiritual life. Yes. With, with, uh, Fantastic in each day, but after they don't. Uh, but they're not <laughs> they don't. together. It is not a. Yes. It's not more a couple, mm -hmm. and at the end, uh, everybody cry for the the uh, divorced or married. But we have to begin to have uh, spirituality the same yes. life spiritual, and uh, il, il y aura alors beaucoup moins de, de divorcés or mariés dans l'église. Yeah. If we get people and couples to pray together, then divorce will, will, will be less of a problem because there'll be fewer of them. Pas un problème aussi important. Voilà. So you wanted to abbreviate what your wife wanted yes. to do and, and we to say, make okay. it doable. We do our yes. prayer and we take... It was a time where computer don't exist. Yes. Uh, we, we write uh, with the tac, 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 oh, uh, typewriters. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, uh, yes. So we buy the liturgy of four, we buy the missal, we buy any prayer and the meditation we love mm -hmm. uh, of saint, of father of church, of, uh, and we take um, uh, scissors. Scissors. Yes. And we and then we take a folder mm -hmm. and we do for every day. Our prayer, inspired by the liturgy of our, mm -hmm. but our prayer, uh, yes. uh, uh, more, more uh, uh, adapté à nos à notre emploi du temps et à notre vie de famille et de couple. Yeah. They, they, so they really have had at heart to pray with the liturgy of the hours, but yes. given their state of life and this was not the, the, the good time in, in in their life to do that. But they wanted to be inspired by the liturgy of of the hours and, and, and this is what the Second Vatican Council asked for in when they reformed the liturgy of the hours is that how lay people could join in mm -hmm. respecting their state of life like, but how yes. could they join in the liturgy of the hours. Right. And at the end, oh, I remember uh, at this time it, it was uh, no, uh, uh, we have a glue in spray, you know, you don't remember that? Yes. And we, and then we put on the right. but but the spray the spray <laughs> right. like that. the original cutting and pasting right yeah, that, exactly. that, that, that. at the end in my house you can you don't need uh, on a plus besoin de clou de quoi pour pour yeah, fixer didn't need les nails choses or, uh, or things to put to hang things you take, on, on, you put on the wall <laughs> it there was so much spray spray glue all over the house they would just stick things on the wall and they would stay <laughs> okay. but at the end at the end we do three or four folders all the, the liturgic time, mm -hmm. and uh, and we begin to pray with our folder, and then we have couple friends. We say, oh, <laughs> we want the same thing, yes. and uh, and uh, and they do their folder too. We we, we on leur a leur appris à le faire, et on leur a montré ce qu'on avait, on leur a donné le modèle. Uh, how they had done it, they, they gave them, they gave those friends their, their own model and, and, and they could do the same. And what year would that have been when that was happening? What? Uh, uh, 88, something like this. So about four years before yes. you actually... Four, no, more, 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 six years. Five, six, six years. years. Okay. More, six years. And, and uh, after, when we go, when there were reunions with friends, and so when they had meetings with friends, with friends, uh, dans la maison d'autres mm -hmm. personnes, in, in, in other people's house, mm -hmm. c'était facile de savoir 
il y a des gens qui arrivaient, ils touchaient les murs et si ça collait, ils disaient « Oh, vous avez adopté la méthode des prières It was des the people's wall if it was sticky oh you're praying with the dumoul thing <laughs> voilà and uh, and after we we i was a publisher in the company of vincent montagne et, et, and i uh, i met a sister who was the responsible of the liturgy of our in the L'équivalent du SCCB. In the French USCCB. Mm -hmm. In the French Bishop Conference. Right. And I, I'll talk of that to her, uh, our uh, prayer. And she said, oh, show me, show me. She, she, it said, oh, you have to publish that mm -hmm. immediately. We have to change anything because it is not exactly the liturgy. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and she worked on, and we, We begin, and she says, I am friend of the, uh, le, le préfet, la congregation. She, she was a friend of the uh, prefect for the, con the congregation of the discipline of the sacraments. Mm -hmm. était un Chilien, le cabinet, le Medina Esteves. Who at that time was the uh, Chilean cardinal, Medina Esteves. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Okay. And, uh, et, et, et elle lui en a parlé, et il m'a invité. Donc. And she talked about it to him. He invited Monsieur Dumont. À Rome, In Rome. Il disait, OK, euh, je vous donne l'ordre de le faire. And he said, I give you the order to do it. Ah. Yeah. And I do it. And he did it. In French. And it was a big success. Immediately a big success. Immediately. Mm. I was going to ask, I'm sorry, just, were you surprised at the reaction when you actually put it out there for the more general public? No, no, I don't, I was surprised because I see in my life and in the life of our friend who, who do that kind mm -hmm. of prayer, the fruit. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, no, it is, uh, it is, uh, uh, in the United States, when I come and I show a Magnificat in France, and I don't speak English, yes. but, uh, so I cannot say nothing to, to influence. To influence. He, his English was almost in, in existence when he came first to to the US, so he couldn't influence uh, people. Uh, and I see the people, oh, oh, so, the, so the people were, were flicking through it, even though it, it was in French. Mm -hmm. And they say, I want that. <laughs> like that. Yes. It was the first who do that. It was, she, she just, uh, she just died now. It is uh, the, oh, uh, his name, Ishcock. It oh, was, yeah, uh, it was uh, Adore in yes. St. Louis. I went in St. Louis, I oh, meet yes. her, yes. I show her, I want. You're yeah, a great lady, <laughs> we're a great lady, we're a great loss. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. She was and on our board for many years. Yeah, yes. she actually, right. uh, uh, one of her drawings in the Magnificat Roman Missal, because she was a very, very good artist as well. Yes. That's it. So when that happened, What, what year was it that actually then the English edition came out? What we would... When did the version American? Oh, it was, it was a miracle. I, I, uh, can, I, uh, can I tell you a small story? Mm -hmm. Please. Uh, I was in my uh, office very... Very late at night. I, I think because I, I have... Mm, all my work like uh, CIO of a big company yes. and I was uh, the lunch of Magnificat of uh, Magnificat and uh, at l'époque j'écrivais dans Magnificat and, and at that time he also was wa writing in Magnificat mm. so he had really uh, his hands were yeah. more than full yeah. mm. et, and uh, uh, the phone ring ring <laughs> It was, the guardian, so the it, was the, it was the watchman at the door of the building. And he said, me, uh, a man with a very strong accent want absolutely to talk to you for Magnifica. And I said, no, I don't take him because you know what it is. I love the people who, who call in the front, but one time or the other, You have for one, for one hour and a half. <laughs> and you have, on n'a pas toujours le temps. And, 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 and at that time, he, he didn't have 
time. Right, so he right. said, no, sorry. And I said, no, no, no. But five minutes after, ring, ring. <laughs> Although he, he insists, he insists very much. Uh, he wants mm -hmm. to go. Well, I say, okay. I and I take the, the phone and one man, Je peux pas imiter l'accent euh, français d'un américain qui parle français. Uh, he can't make the accent of, a f of an American man speaking French. <laughs> <laughs> so I say in English. And, and the man says, uh, Pierre-Marie Dumont, I say, yes. I say, I have to tell you, my father is dead. And I was very angry, but I say, I have for one hour to say, oh, I am uh, with you. And, uh, and I say, I am. I say what we say in this kind of situation. And after he said, Il m'a laissé une immense fortune. He left me a huge amount of money. I say, I am happy for you, but ça vous rendra pas vous paix. Ça vous rendra pas vous paix. He said, I'm very happy for you. That won't, that won't bring back your father, but it's better than nothing. And he said, how, how it would cost to launch Magnificat in the uh, US? And I say, uh, Two million dollars. And he say, okay, uh, I come tomorrow and I give you the check. Yeah. And it happened like that. It sounds like a Mother Angelica story. <laughs> yes, it is. Right, yes, right. So there's lots of connections there, and of course. And this man was, ma was uh, uh, not married. He was, uh, he was engaged at that Engaged time. with a French uh, young Human, uh, young girl, uh, young girl. Okay. yes, uh, uh, and he, he lived in France before his marriage with this woman, and he, this woman has Magnificat, and he learned Magnificat. Ah. Well, we, do, we want to tell you how much we appreciate all your work and what you've done, because Magnificat means so much to so many people here, certainly around the world, and uh, let alone the United States. And, and keep uh, putting together books. It's amazing what you're working on and we're just gonna have to let you go as we have the day has to continue. We've got the procession coming up. Thank you so much, Mr. Dumont, for finding the time yes, to visit us. I can tell only it is not my work. It is a prayer of the church. There and we it go. Is, it is because it is a prayer, the true prayer of the yes. church, it works. It works. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for putting wheels on those prayers. Thank you yes. so much. Thank you. We're speaking here with uh, Mr. Dumont and we'll be back with more from the Magnificat event from Memphis, Tennessee. Some other people you'll want to see. We got a procession coming up later. You don't want to miss that either. Stay with us. back here live for the Magnificat Day, Day of Joy, and it's uh, coming to you live from the Memphis Cook Convention Center. I'm Doug Keck, joined on set as always by my compatriot, Father Joseph Mary Wolf, who is our wonderful chaplain at EWTN. And we're also uh, joined right now, a very special guest, a powerful speaker you just saw a few minutes ago, and a good friend of the network, Father Robert Barron. Thank you so much, Father Barron, for finding the time. And once Always again, delightful this, to be with you. this second year in a row, you've, you've yeah. spoken at one of these conferences, right? And it's a joy. I love this conference. Uh, there's a great buzz, a great energy, wonderful people come. And as I said, Magnificat, I think, is one of the great gifts of the church in the last 25 years. And, um, you know, Father Peter John Cameron and Monsieur Dumont, as I said, I think are really heroes of the new evangelization. So I'm delighted to support them any way I can. Well, it's interesting. We just got a chance to talk to uh, Father, uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Dumont. I'm, I'm promoting you here, Mr. Dumont. And it's amazing how the story of how Magnificat started is very much similar to a lot of the stories we, we get to tell about Mother Angelica. They always you know? start small, don't they? I mean, all these things, and then it's the Holy Spirit that blesses a movement, and then you just see it. It manifests itself. A word on Fire, my own ministry, it begins say, right, also right, in a right. very small way. And then it grows, I mean, through God's grace. So those are wonderful stories. But, you know, I knew, um, I didn't know him personally, but I was in Paris mm -hmm. doing my doctoral work when Cardinal Lustiger was the Archbishop. And Dumont and company were kind of part of the Lustiger circle. Mm -hmm. And Magnificat came out of that time. Lustiger was the John Paul II of France. You know, he had the John Paul II spirit. It was the era of Cardinal O'Connor in our country. 
and there, it just gave rise to a lot of spiritual energy. The World Youth Day that was there, yeah. wasn't it? Uh, all that. The, and Luce TJ used right. to preach every Sunday night at Notre Dame at 6.30. And I would typically go to that Mass just to hear him preach. And in the French manner, he would preach for a half hour, but it never seemed long. He was a wonderful uh, speaker, a great presence, you know, with that very rich background. As he lost his mother during the Shoah. He himself is a convert from Judaism. So he's a wonderful presence. And I was blessed to be there studying during those years. And one of the things, too, I wanted to mention, I uh, have to get our plugs in here as well, uh, Catholicism, New Evangelization. Your program is going to be airing on EW10 December 18th, so you look for that, so I want to make sure people remember that. Also, if you happen to be watching, uh, you can always get DVDs of the entire event uh, through our EWTN Religious Catalog, but also we are going to be re-airing, I believe, on November 8th at 5 p.m., the talks of both uh, Father Cameron and also Father Barron, so I wanted to mention that as well. Great. In your series, you sh try to show the beauty of Catholicism and how that's a tool of evangelization. Certainly yeah. this event really brings that to the fore, doesn't it? That's Magnificat. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that they knew that early on what Pope Francis called the Via Pulchritudinus, right? The way of the beautiful. Mm -hmm. And they got that, Magnificat, by having this, these beautiful uh, reproductions of great art, having poetry. Even being here this morning with the, you know, the Memphis Symphony Orchestra playing, it was magnificent. Uh, when I heard you know, the Ode to Joy melody at the end there with the full orchestra, that's a very uh, valid evangelical impulse or instinct to say, let's begin with the beautiful and draw people in. Uh, so Magnificat got that early on. Is that attraction? Is the force of attraction you think yeah. that beauty has toward us, on us? Yes, it's less off-putting for postmodern people than the true and the good. As I've mm. often said, you know, the true, well, is true for you, not for me. That's a good who, point, right? who are you to tell me what's good? Right. But the beautiful is just there. Yeah. Just there. Look, I'm not telling you what to think or what to do. Just look at that. Look at the Sistine Chapel. Listen to, to Mozart, you know? Mm. So I think it has this winsome quality that then draws you in to the true and the good well, eventually. Does beauty transcend then? Does it send, send cultures and I think places? So. You know, I yeah. mean, is it something that we can all connect to? Is that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I mean look at the people coming into the Sistine Chapel. Uh, there's people all over the world. You know, there's something universal about the truly beautiful. And that's true, you know, for us looking at something truly beautiful from a culture alien to ours, but we say, yeah, I get it. And that was one of the things too, when you went out and did your Catholicism series, in a sense, the cinematography, yeah. the high definition, yeah. really the panoramic views to inca capture all that beauty, right? Absolutely. And we're doing a new series now on the pivotal players, we're calling it. Right, and I right, filmed right. for Aquinas and Catherine of Siena uh, this past summer. Mm -hmm. And they're almost done, the two episodes. And we're same thing, the same team, same cinematographer. And how many episodes will there actually Ten. be? Ten. Okay. Yeah, so we've, uh, we're going to film again in January over in England and Ireland. We're doing Newman and Chesterton. Um, so it should be very English, January in England. It should be a lot of snow and mm -hmm. gloomy days. But uh, we want to show all the beauty in these places. I love the contrast you made between the ego drama and the theodrama. Yeah. Talk about in your own life the theodrama that has worked out, Word on Fire, the yeah. Catholicism series. Right, and that's Balthazar's language I've always loved. You know, the, the drama that God is directing and producing is by far the more interesting yes. of the two. And to let go of the ego drama, and I would say, too, I told that little autobiographical story of my own vocation, which was Aquinas when I was 14. That was my invasion of grace. I mentioned Isaiah, you know, in the year the King Uzziah died, I had this vision of God. That was my version of that. <laughs> the year the King Uzziah died was 1974, when I was a freshman in high school. Um, and then, yeah, Word on Fire was very much part of that theodramatic. We sort of followed the, um, the rhythm of it. I didn't really know what would happen with Word on Fire. Then Cardinal George got behind it in a big way. Uh, and then we went out and raised money for various projects, and, and so it goes. And I do think it was something of the Holy Spirit. It's like Mother, I remember one time there was a priest who was, had this idea for just starting big in this whole radio production yeah. that was going to happen all over the country. And his mother said, that's not how God works. He starts small, exactly. and starts then it grows, small. Right. Well, it typically. Grows that way. And, it, and you've seen it, too, because uh, success builds on success. You yeah. put it out there. And there are plenty of people out there who, inside, know they want to do something. And by creating something, whether it's EW Chan or Word on Fire, you give people a platform, an yeah. opportunity where they say, I can contribute. Yes. I can be part of it. Yes, I think both those are true. The beginning small, the mustard seed principle, but also that principle that when you're doing something which is blessed by God, people come to it, they're attracted mm -hmm. to it. Um, whether it's Rose Hawthorne who says, look, 
I just want to help people who are dying of cancer. And in her own apartment, she would invite people in. Well, within a few weeks, people were coming to help her. Mother Teresa going out in the slums of Calcutta on her own. Within a few weeks, her former students are coming to join her. So it always works that way. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, now on a more minor key, a word on fire, the people that were attracted to its work, and, and now they're down there right now keeping it going. You know, so. Right, exactly. And one of the other things, just before we go, one of the things I was thinking about in talking about the evangelization and beauty, young people today, I was thinking about the Don Johnson story, yeah. you know, and I, I was thinking to myself, I was kidding Father Joseph, I guess there's a lot of people out there who say, well, if I had despair, I'd, I'd like Don Johnson's despair, because at <laughs> yeah. least uh, I'd have some fun while I'm despairing. But why is it we can show so many times how empty the lives of the people, the great people we see out there yeah. in the celluloid word is, and people still don't get it. Yeah. Is it that they don't understand the, the reality of the alternative? It's original sin, I would say, yeah. to put it in theological language, that you're right, we tell that story over and over and over again from the beginning of literature till now, and yet we don't get it. I think you have to experience it probably. Right. It's like someone hitting bottom, you know, who has to go through that experience. You can tell them until you're blue in the face, look, you're going to hit bottom. Until they do, they won't get it. Um, but all these morality tales exist. Well, thank you so much for finding the time to stop by. My thank pleasure. you for your wonderful talk and your wonderful work. And we look forward to December 18th, certainly on Good. EWTN as well. Thank you so much, Father. Both. Okay. Thanks. Speaking here with uh, Father Robert Barron, live from the Magnificat Day, Day of Joy. And we have much more ahead. Stay with us. Welcome back to EW10's live coverage of the Nicot Day, and it's the Day of Joy, and it has been a joyful day here from Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, I'm joined on set by Father Joseph Mary Wolf, our chaplain, and we're talking all about, really, about evangelization through beauty in many ways. Beautiful music, and speaking of beauty, we have Flair Neber, who is an artist and who was the person we got to talk to you last year in Philadelphia, and you designed, actually, the reliquary, is that what it is? And uh, why don't you talk a little bit about the work that you do for Magnificat? Okay. Um, yes, indeed, I designed the reliquary of Saint Therese of Lisieux and her blessed parents, Louis and Zélie. Um, the Magnificat Foundation has been entrusted with those very precious reliques last year um, for the first Magnificat, the Magnificat in Philadelphia. And I, I was commissioned to create that. Um, box, but such a box, you know, um, when you are an artist of sacred art, you have to not only to give images and shapes to things, but also to try to serve. Mm -hmm. And here I had to serve three very beautiful people, three holy people. So the reliquary is mostly three individual reliquaries together. Mm -hmm. And um, the the parents are linked by wedding rings because... That's beautiful. Mm, it's a beautiful, beautiful symbol, it's true. Yeah. Because I think they were made uh, blessed by one each other through mm -hmm. the sacrament of marriage. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to underline that, that beauty and that, that power of the sacrament of marriage. And they are also represented by flowers. And it's according to a, a drawing from Therese herself. Um, and of course, Therese is a rose, every, everyone knows that. Mm -hmm. And it's mostly because she, she told us, um, I will spend my, life, my heaven to do good on earth and you will see, I will let fall a shower of roses. So what is moving in, in that reliquary is most of people know Therese, but few people, fewer people know the parents. They were fantastic, fabulous Catholic people, really. Uh, Louis was the clockmaker and Zélie was a lace maker and they were very honest and good workers. They loved each other very, very much. And they were parents as well. They had nine children. They had the, the immense joy to have nine children and the immense pain also to lose four of them. But they never, they ne never lose hope in the face. They were strongly anchored in, in God's love. 
when you did the design, you have the roses mm -hmm. for Therese. Her, her, her parents are those lilies, lilies right? Mm -hmm. What was, wh why lilies? Why did you pick lilies? Is there some significance related to them? Yes, it's, it's a drawing of Therese. You know, um, at the very beginning when I had to create it, that, it was, it was challenging because they are so blessed and so saints. Mm -hmm. So the first thing an artist has to do is to listen, to take time to listen. And you are like an empty bottle and you need to be filled. So for months and months and months, I'm, I read Therese's books mm -hmm. and biographies on the parents. And one day I, f I found that drawing uh, by Therese mm -hmm. representing her own family. And they were lilies and roses. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Now the domestic church idea too, I thought mm -hmm. that was a beautiful illustration, how you have the domestic mm -hmm. church represented, which is the family. Mm -hmm. And within the family and within marriage, then you also had the consecrated life of St. Therese. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Let's explain that. We, the thing is, a reliquary needs to, it is protection for the relics. So you need to protect that, those precious things. But you know, I didn't want it, the protection to be just a cover. So that's why I'm, I was looking for a shape uh, which could have a, a, a sense, a meaning. Mm -hmm. That's why I did that uh, shape of a chapel. Yes. Because the family is the very first church yes. where you learn faith mm -hmm. and you learn sanctity for the Martin family. How did your working with the reliquy uh, impact your faith or your devotion to St. Therese? Was it there before? Have you grown in it? Mm -hmm. How has it affected you? Um, truth is, I was like um, Father Baron. My first look on Therese's work <laughs> was not the good one. I thought she was too, yes, too sentimental. It was too, too sweet for me. Yes. And one day I was asked by the sanctuary of Lisieux to build a whole chapel everything from bottom to top, altar, embo, and so on. And so I had to have a second look. <laughs> and then I really discovered how powerful she is. Even she's young, kind, gentle, simple. She's really like, she says that herself, she's like a soldier, but a good soldier, you know, someone with strength. So after that second look, I was really uh, a friend. I became a friend of Therese. And, and her, so I did the reliquary in that um, mindset. <laughs> her parents, has that influenced your own marriage and family life? I know you just had a child uh, mm -hmm. this past year, right? Exactly, and it's true that uh, I also got married. I was working um, around the Martin family. Yes, it's, it's a fabulous thing as an, an example. And um, yes, it's of course that influences. And I was reading the other day something, uh, of, of a sentence of Zelie saying that she, will, um, she, she was teaching the children morning and evening. She was teaching the prior. And my first daughter is just 10 months old, but <laughs> I say, oh, <laughs> I should do the same <laughs> pretty soon. Yes. Right. Now, besides working on the reliquy, do you, are you also involved with other parts of either the Magnificata Foundation as far as artwork and things like that? I'm definitely a Magnificata. <laughs> before, before even being a part of anything, uh, I was a subscriber to Magnificat years ago. And then, then I, I started to a collaboration with um, Magnificat, uh, writing articles on art. And now I'm more involved with the Magnificat Foundation through the reliquary and through a diamond, an artistic dimension in the Magnificat Day. And I don't know if you noticed that, but really for me as an artist, a Magnificat Day is a fabulous blend of music, liturgy, artworks, beauty, decoration, flowers. But the combination of all these elements are making something bigger, which is for me, which is really a grace, honestly. And you know, I'm a part of all of this, but I'm also really just an attendee and I'm enjoying it so much, <laughs> really. Have you done some of the descriptions of the artwork? Yes, but in the yes. French edition, because French my edition. English is not French good French. enough. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate your beautiful work and we also know you're expecting, so good luck. 
with your next child. Thank it's on you. the way. And please invite everyone to come and venerate the Martins. They are right. really if you're here today, fabulous example for yeah. all of us. Right, and some wonderful programs even on EWTN. We feature the, the family and certainly St. Therese talking here with Flair and Bear, who uh, designed their reliquy, which is a beautiful. We saw some pictures of it just moments ago. We're going to take a break. Much more ahead here from Magnificat Day in Memphis, Tennessee. Stay with us. Thank you so much for staying with us here for the Magnificat Day, the Day of Joy. We're live from Memphis, Tennessee, and joined on set by our chairman and CEO, Mr. Michael Warsaw, we saw a little earlier. Give a short talk uh, and thank you to the Magnificat people right, right before lunch, and it's, it's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. And one of the things we've seen over the last year, certainly, I know, uh, you know, I know in the last year or so with the Philadelphia event on, we there's certainly been a lot more involvement and contact and, and really a, a relationship building with the whole Magnificat organization. But as Father Joseph reminded me just before we came on here, uh, and you mentioned, it really goes back to Mother Angelica in the 90s, right? Absolutely. When, uh, when Pierre-Marie Dumont uh, and Vincent Montagne uh, really had the idea of bringing the Magnificat magazine to the United States of America. Of course, they had, they had been publishing it in France for several years, but they really felt it was something that could benefit the people of the United States. Uh, one of their first contacts was with Mother Angelica, and uh, Mother invited them to be on her live show uh, some 15 years ago, and, and really uh, was very, very supportive of what it was that they were trying to do. Um, to, to create a magazine that could help foster uh, a solid understanding of liturgy, a solid prayer life and devotions. Um, and as we know, that was something obviously that Mother spent uh, most of her active years at EWTN trying to promote and trying to encourage among uh, our EWTN family. So uh, it was very natural that, that Mother would be attracted to this project and want to support that. Right, and it's also interesting in, in getting to talk to Mr. Damon a little bit and stuff. You could see where he would connect with Mother Angelica. Absolutely. That very Absolutely. real, he is yes. who he appears, just yes. like Mother was. Yes, and that complete and total trust in divine providence. I, I think, you know, certainly they share that, uh, that uh, understanding and that sense of, of, you know, God will provide and, and willing to step forward and, and uh, you know, as Mother's iconic line that I repeat so often, you know, dare to do uh, the ridiculous uh, so that God can accomplish the miraculous. Right. And, and I think in many ways that's also the parallel story of right. the Magnificat uh, magazine right. and the Magnificat uh, group as a whole. Yeah, so, he just told us that story just a few minutes ago about the, how the English edition got started. It sounded very Mother Angelica-esque <laughs> uh, some of the stories that certainly we've heard many years. And, you, you many times you have witnessed take, directly. Yes, <laughs> Mother would take a step forward to see if God would bless it. And then, like uh, Mr. Dumont said, that other people are drawn to it. It's like the Lord inspired others to be part of the network, mm -hmm. to be part of the Magnificat work, because it's not something that one individual could right. ever accomplish. Others have to be drawn by the Lord, too. Right. And, uh, right. and we're seeing that. We, we talked about your series, The Church Universal, all these different groups and organizations out there. And again, Magnificat fits right into there with their publishing and getting to people in their homes and the privacy of going to church, praying. Right. And so there's really the outlook now of seeing all these different Catholic outreach groups that are actually out there that sometimes are under the radar and people like with EW10 they right. think well it's a, it's a television station no we're so much more right. gee Magnificat that's all it is is it helps you get through mass right exactly that that it's so much more than a magazine and as we've seen here today throughout this day and, and through the Magnificat Foundation this idea of you know going out into communities and mm -hmm. holding days like this uh, that can inspire and, and really uh, it's another dimension of Magnificat's apostolate uh, beyond the print magazine and, and I think that's where uh, the collaboration with EWTN that was begun 
those many years ago with Mother Angelica, mm -hmm. uh, I think continues to play out today mm -hmm. where we can collaborate to bring this great event outside the walls of this theater and this great facility mm -hmm. to our audience around the world who, who really, um, I think, can be inspired by the Magnificat approach of, of beauty, truth, and goodness. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's, that's so much a part of our mission and our apostolate throughout the years, and so much a part of what Mother Angelica founded EWTN to mm -hmm. be, was to be that light in the world, to show the truth, mm -hmm. the beauty, the goodness that the church has to offer to a world that's starving mm -hmm. for that, starving for that. Right, and it's interesting too in some ways, I mean we've got EW10 coming out of Birmingham, Alabama, seems contradictory, shouldn't be. We think of As France. As mother would say, it's uh, God's sense of humor. That right, exactly. EWTN right. would have ended up in uh, there. Carnegie, and then you've got, in a sense, this uh, Magnificat coming out of France. Now, it may have been a faithful daughter of the church at one time, but certainly over the last 20 or 30 years, it hasn't been known for being the powerhouse of the Catholic Church and for something again to come out of a lay initiative like this to come out of France and to now be going to multiple languages just like EWTN reaches out in multiple languages. A absolutely, I think out of that adversity that, that certainly I think the, the Church in France was, was feeling mm -hmm. uh, in, in many days and times, not, not dissimilar to what we in the United mm -hmm. States were going through uh, as well. And yet these, these great apostolates uh, founded in faith and reliance and trust in God's providence by dynamic individuals uh, have been able to come out of those circumstances right. and to have a global impact. Uh, you know, just as we often right. say and as we know, uh, you know, until we, uh, until we reach the gates of heaven, we probably will never know right. the number of people that have been impacted by Mother's Mission and by EWTN. Um, and I think we could you know, say the same is probably true of, of Magnificat and, and the Magnificat community as well, that mm -hmm. uh, so, so many people on a global basis uh, are impacted by uh, this simple idea of, mm -hmm. of creating something that allows them and has allowed them for many years to deepen mm -hmm. their commitment to prayer to the liturgical life of the church in their own devotional life. You know, God raises up saints to meet a particular need in a particular time. You look at that in the history of the church, mm -hmm. and it's also true in our own time, right, that he inspires people to meet the needs of the times. Right. So EWTN is an answer to that, Magnificat, right. these different movements that we are covering in the church. Right. And what's great to see is a, 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 a thing that we, we see by seeing things like that, but the idea that there's wonderful, talented Catholics people who are devoted to the church, who many times are just looking for an opportunity to see how they can express that. They give it an opportunity, whether it's the Magnificat Foundation, EWT, to be able to participate and say, I'd like to do something. Now I see there's a platform. Now I see there's, there's a venue where maybe I can step forward with my treasures or my skill set or whatever to really move things to the next level. Everybody always says, you know, the church needs to be doing it in such a way. It needs to be as good, it needs to be as beautiful for God as anything else is done in the secular world. But it takes us working together. We can all talk about it, we can all pray about it, and those are things that are important. We also have to get out and start to do something about it. Absolutely, I think uh, there's always that danger that we all say, well, somebody should do something. Somebody should do yes. that. And, and I think the great thing about uh, certainly the witness of Mother Angelica's life, I think Monsieur Dumont in his own way, so many others, is people willing to go out and say, yes, something needs to be done and I will do it. I will step forward in faith and I will make this happen with God's help. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's how we transform the church, it's how we transform lives, it's how we transform our societies. Mm -hmm. We begin that Theo adventure, you know, that right, Father Barron right. was talking about, mm -hmm. the, that when we choose to follow God and let Him be the one that creates the drama in our life, it's an adventure, but it's an exciting adventure. Right. Because new avenues open up and our own spiritual life deepens and gets enriched too. Right, and I was thinking about when he was talking about that Theo adventure versus that ego kind of yeah. theater, and, and the fact that which, which we all need to make sure we do as we're moving our, our apostolates forward or working these things, that we keep our eye on the prize that ultimately it's the greater good. And that you know we need to work together to realize that all of us have different gifts and that we're not gonna achieve it just by us being the only person into the room. That it's going to take all different people from all different walks of life with all different approaches if we're gonna reach everybody. 
Absolutely. It's, you know, to use that analogy that Father Barron used of, you know, keeping Christ at the center of the wheel, you know, of the, the wheel of fortune as we go through our lives. Mm -hmm. You know, Christ at the center. And I think as long as we uh, remember that, mm -hmm. you know, then we have the perspective proper. And I think that's the, one of the things that uh, I think strikes so many people about uh, when they come to EWTN. I mean, we live it every day. We're there every day. Um, but the fact that uh, at the heart and the center of EWTN is the chapel, where our Lord is present in the Blessed Sacrament, uh, where the nuns for their years on the campus adored our Lord 24 hours a day. And so for us, uh, the heart of our apostolate is the Eucharist. And I think it's, I think it's wonderful, too, that we see as, as this Magnificat Day begins to draw to a close, we see the event focus on the Eucharistic presence of our right. Lord right, exactly. as, we, as we see this Eucharistic procession that will take place tonight through the streets of Memphis uh, to close with that amazing and beautiful and very visual reminder uh, of, of the centrality of the Eucharist in our lives as Catholics. And how if we want to succeed, it's got to be there. If it's not, that's where the power comes from. Well, thank you, Michael, as always. Thank you so much for adding some wisdom to our day. We're here at the Magnificat Day in Memphis, Tennessee. That's right, there's going to be a procession. We've got evening prayer. It's all ahead. Stay with us.